I have got a real exciting sermon about depression <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we've been talking about things that block the move of the Spirit in your life. And uh, praise God. Uh, do we have, is everything taken care of? Did I forget any announcement about anything today? I forgot to take the, oh, I forgot to speak over the offering, didn't I? See, that's, that's why I have sharp people working for me. It's too bad they don't have a salary, I would fire them. No, that's, <laughs> now, uh, Sherry, where'd you go, Sherry? I, I was just teasing. Okay, let's make our proclamation over our offering. I proclaim, I declare, and I decree that these funds are more than sufficient for every good work that this house of God has been called to do, debt-free and in abundance. And I proclaim, I declare, and I decree that these funds, according to Scripture, will be multiplied back into my house so that I will have all sufficiency for every good work that God has called me to do, debt-free and in abundance. <coughs> wow, praise God. Well, we started uh, several weeks talking about some of these um, emotional things, and somebody asked me, they said, you know, um, your sermon was very emotional. And I thought, well, that's pretty good, because I'm talking about emotions. And, uh, you know, it's <laughs> praise God. Okay, moving right along. There are things, what we have been building up to, is there are things that block your prayers getting answered, and they block the joy that you should have in life. As a Christian, you should have joy. You should be a happy person. If you live in a community of 25 or 30 houses in your subdivision, you should be one of the happiest people there. People should be able to see the joy of the Lord in your life. You should be the person who smiles. When you take your walk, kids should look at you and smile instead of running inside crying. <laughs> See, look, one of the things that hinders all of this is pride. As I've mentioned many times before, one of the best CD series I have ever done, I have a five CD set, uh, they've also got it on a flash drive up in the bookstore, uh, is my series on pride. The problem is, it's also has been, I'm not confessing it will be, but it has been probably my worst selling CD set that I've ever done in my life because everybody looks at it and says, I know somebody that needs that. <clears throat> See, most people, when you start talking about pride, they don't think you're talking about them. They think you're talking about somebody else. So the first thing that we got to do this morning is you got to get it out of your head that this sermon is for your husband or your wife or for your mama or your dad or your kids or your ex you know did you anybody see this on YouTube a couple days ago they had a little kid in church he got up and he was he was singing the books of the Bible anybody see that he and it was, it was kind of like a presentation you saw it he's singing the books of the Bible and then he got done and and he continued singing all my exes live in Texas you know and, and so you know, it's, you know, things that, things that you bring into yourself, they come out. You know, you are what you eat, and that's physical, and that is spiritual. What you hear is what you say. You know, if, if somebody comes up and slaps you upside the head, and the first word that comes out of your mouth is a curse word, you didn't just make that up. You've been around it. You've been hearing it. Maybe you've even been saying it. But get all of this about it belonging to somebody else out of the way. And somebody may say, well, you know, this isn't pride with me. I just always make a positive confession. Yeah, a positive confession. I am the best. You know, see, no, there's a difference between a positive confession and a prideful confession. You should never think of yourself less than what God thinks of you, but you, you can't be prideful in it. 
you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But you must understand where that power comes from. It comes from Him. Because without Him, according to the Scripture, without Him, we're nothing. The Scripture says without Him, we have nothing. See, a person can be successful and have pride in it, but a person can have failure and have pride in it. There are people who take pride in their poverty. There are people who just, hey, I'm humble, and I am proud of it. You know, some people flaunt their humility, and that's not true humility. You need to know who you are in Christ, and you need to understand this. Pride is not of God. Now, I won't go into it as deep, but Thursday night we covered this pretty heavily. Pride is not a good thing. You need to say that. Pride, Pride. is a sin. Now, somebody may say, yeah, I understand that, but I'm, I'm proud of my grandson. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my school. I'm proud of the soccer team. You know, well, that's a sin. You say, no, no, I'm not talking about that kind of pride. I'm talking about good pride. Well, it's kind of like saying, I'm not talking about that kind of adultery. I'm talking about good adultery. No. <laughs> I'm not talking about bad lying. I'm talking about good lying. No, you know, things that are a sin are sin. And you can try to justify them. And somebody may say, well, but I am proud of them. You know what? Let me tell you something. That could be part of your problem. People who are proud of their soccer team at the World Cup or whatever, this is why in some countries you have all of the people in the yellow shirts emptying off the bleachers, running across, beating up all the people in the green shirts. They don't even know those people, but they have such pride in their team. Are you following me? That all reason just goes out. I've, I've been to children's football games, baseball games, soccer games, where parents just get spitting mad. They get in the coach's face. That's not right. Well, it got quiet in here. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, would you say that those are not good things? Okay. Here's what's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it's of the world. Now, once again, from time to time, I goof up on this, but I am trying to clean up my language. And somebody may say, well, when I say I'm proud of this, I may be saying that, but that's, that's not really what I mean. Well, here's the concept. Why don't we say what we mean? You know, uh, God didn't say, this is my beloved son, and I'm proud of this boy. That's not really what I meant. You know what I mean. No, God said what he, what he meant. He said, this is my beloved son. And in him, I'm well pleased. How do I feel about my grandson? I'm thankful for him. I'm grateful, and I'm well pleased. Okay. And so somebody, now there, there's a definition right there. Well, you know how I feel about him now. I'm thankful for him. I'm grateful for him. I'm well pleased with him. That's good. Rather than saying, I'm proud of him. You say anything bad about him. Oh, whack you. See, you know, pride, pride promotes violence a lot of times. See, and pride constantly tries to prove something. It's always trying to prove itself. Many, many people who in some ways make it to the top are constantly trying to prove something, and they're never wrong. Have, have you ever met somebody who was never wrong? I mean, they're like, never wrong. It, okay, now it's okay to think of somebody else. <laughs> They're never wrong. And even when they're wrong, they put a spin on it. Well, yeah, that's not really wrong. And they'll change history in their conversation. You know, they'll, they'll make you think that yesterday happened completely different than what had happened by the time they're done. Because they'll do anything it takes so that they will be right. You know what that is? That's pride. <laughs> See, pride is always trying to act impressive. But see, as a Christian, we don't need to act impressive, just be impressive. 
You know, don't, don't act like you're smart. Be smart. Don't act like, you, you know, my mama used to say to me, act like you got some sense. Well, you can act like it, but that doesn't give you sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Once again, my dad, bless his heart, he's with the Lord right now, so he's in that cloud of witnesses looking on. So, Dad, this, is, this one's for you. But my dad, I, I'm so thankful he didn't believe that his words carried power. Surely, my dad obviously was not a word of faith man. He was a, he was a good Baptist deacon, but he was obviously not word of faith. Because if, and I'm glad he wasn't to a degree, because he had no faith in his words. Because he would say things to me like, don't you get smart. You know, it's like, boy, praise God. Some of you are thinking, well, maybe he had more faith in his words than you know. Uh, <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness. Now, see, the word lowly means humble. In the Bible, New Testament Greek, the word lowly means humble. Let everything be done with humility. Let each one esteem others better than himself. When, when you walk in a room, don't act like you're the big wheel all the time. Come on. You may be the big wheel, but you don't have to act like you're better than everybody else. Now listen, you can have more authority than somebody else, but that doesn't mean you have to act like you're better than them. And there is a difference. You know, a teacher can walk into a room and have authority, and have more authority than anybody else in the room. The teacher can. But the teacher can also have humility and, and honor the other people in the room. Honor the students. They may have more authority. That doesn't mean the teacher is a better person than the students. We need a balance in this in our thinking. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 18 talks about how we can um, commend ourselves. And that really doesn't do much. It's really who the Lord commends. Oh, here it is. For not he who commends himself is approved. You want to get it proved? It's not by you commending yourself. It's not by you saying, hey, I'm smooth, I'm great. I'm... No, it's not you. It's who the Lord commends. Wow. But see, spiritual pride can hinder the move of God. And that happens when you start comparing everything. Uh, you, you cannot get into this business of comparing because anytime you compare, you always try to position yourself so that you're better. Now, even when it comes to churches and ministries and teaching. See, one thing years ago that I really feel that we got stopped in this church before it ever really gets started was people saying things like, you know, my church is better than the church down the street or up the street or whatever. You know, uh, there are 153 churches around the lake here in Miller, Morgan, Camden County. There's 153 churches. A lot of churches. We're not in competition with the churches. Somebody puts in another church down the street and somebody says to me, oh, pastor, are you worried? Worried about what? Worried that somebody else is building a house to honor God? Hello? No, I'm for that. Now, if somebody puts in, you know, a nudie bar where they got a bunch of poles where women dance that can't get a man, you know, the whole thing is, is I'm against that. I'm against the liquor store. I'm against the adult bookstore. I'm not against the church. So, you know, our church is going to be the best church. No, no. Where in the Bible does it say that our church has to be the best church? See, and somebody says, well, then how do you rise to a level of excellence? You just do that. You rise to a level of excellence. You know, when I was in Israel with uh, Billy Brim on uh, one of our tours many years ago, uh, Billy asked me to uh, monitor a bus. And uh, you, you've... I'm sure many of you have heard that story about how when I was in fifth grade, I prayed every day that God would allow me to be the bus monitor. And because the bus monitor got to set up by the driver and you had that little strap with a badge on it. It looked like a police badge. I mean, it looked important. And there was always that kid 
you know, that's set up there by the bus driver. And when the bus would stop, the kid would stand up, hold the pole next to the bus driver, reach over and grab the handle, and open the door. They were like in charge. Close the door, set back down, and in that exalted seat next to the bus driver. And I remember praying, you know, I said, Lord, I'm in fifth grade. Lord, I want to be a bus captain. Lord. Well, fifth grade came and went, and I never was like ever a bus captain. And it's amazing how, you know, when you put your faith out there, it stays out there. If you don't put doubt and unbelief with it, your faith stays out there. So we were in Israel, and we had eight buses. It was right after 9-11. We were the only tourists in Israel. Right after 9-11, right after the Twin Towers came down, we had eight bus loads of 40 people on a bus. And uh, so Billy Bram had put this tour together, and she, she came to me, and she said, I would like for you to be, she said, I'm going to be uh, the tour person on bus number one, but she said, I'd like for you to be the bus monitor for bus number two. And your job every day is to, when, the, when everybody, it, it was all preachers, basically, she said, when everybody gets on the bus, you lead them in the reading of Psalm 91, and and you're kind of in charge of this bus. And so that very first morning, I got up there, and I looked down at that seat next to the driver, and they had this little thing you were supposed to wear, you know, and you got to open the door. And, and I thought, wow, after all these years, God has not forgotten, you know. He hasn't forgotten. And that was a step up. It was good. But see, here's the thing. The people on our bus started saying things like, hey, we want our bus to be the best bus. Now, competition's okay. You know, sports competition's okay. But when you start wanting to compare the spirituality of a bus to another bus, and I just felt the Spirit of God come upon me, and I said, no, look, we're not going to have competition with the other buses because we're not, we're not going to rejoice if they're late someplace. We're not going to rejoice if they have a flat tire. We're not... We're not going to rejoice, you know, if they get pelted with rocks from the Palestinians. We're, we're not going to rejoice at that. Um, we don't want to have the best bus. We just want to have the most excellent bus that we can have. And it was like, yes. And then all of the other bus monitors of the other six or seven buses, they all started saying, yes, we want an excellent bus too. And so then all of us wanted to have excellent buses, but we worked together we weren't in competition with each other. We didn't have bus number two trying to run bus number four off the road. So we could, because pride will do that. Man, they had a flat tire. You know, we're going to get more. No, see, that's, that's starting to rejoice in somebody else's problems. You don't rejoice when somebody else has a problem. It, it's just kind of like, now, my grandson, you know, uh, he, he plays football. But see, here's the deal. I, I've actually been... Uh, watching a game with somebody, a baseball game. I remember one time watching a Major League Baseball game, and it was a tight game, and one of the players on the other team in the Major Leagues, one of the players on the other team got injured. He either broke his ankle or, or something happened. He had to come out of the game, and he was one of their big players. And I remember the person I was with there going, yes, we can win now. You know, with that, And I'm thinking, wait a minute. No, if we win, we want to actually be a better team. We don't want to win because, you know, the other team forgot their uniforms. Or we don't want to win because the other team broke a leg. Or, you know, we want to win because we actually can win. Are, are you following? But pride, pride wants you to win no matter what. You can have two ice skaters. And pride will cause one of the ice skaters to break the other ice skater's legs. Are you following me? That's not, that's not us. That's, that's not the way a Christian should live. And let me tell you something. The world can see pride. The world can see pride. And I think Christians just need to start getting it out of their system. You say, well, but, but Pastor, I just got the good kind of pride. No, no, no. You need to understand this. Adultery, homosexuality, lying, stealing, not honoring your parents. I and mean, you go through the list of things in the Bible that says, thou shalt not. There's no good to any of those. 
See, there's a definite line between good and evil. In John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's the devil. But I have come that you might have life. That's Jesus. There is a, a dividing line between good and evil. James 1.17 says, every good, James 1.17, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, that means God doesn't change. As we say over in Climax Springs where I was born, if it ain't good, it ain't God. God's good, the devil's bad. You need to understand that. Pride is not in the area of gray. Pride is in the area of evil. Pride is what got the devil kicked out of heaven. Okay? So, pride compares. Pride says, I can do things better. Pride takes uh, credit when credit's not due. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In layman's language, that, that means... Uh -huh. Watch out if you think you're a big dude and nobody can, can touch you because pride cometh before a fall. All right? So, um, hmm. Jesus dealt with this with his disciples in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 46. It says, there was a dispute that broke out among the disciples. And here's what the dispute was. Which one of us is the best? Come on now. Really, Jesus. Y you've been around this for a while. We've been talking about it. But which one of us is the greatest? Come on. Come on. You know. <laughs> well, you know, big woo. Here's the deal. When Jesus got crucified, they all ran like, you know. Excuse me, I started. Cassie, I started to say like little girls. <laughs> but but they, they considered themselves to be, you know, men. I'll never leave you, Jesus, because I'm one of the great ones. Anybody know this, Jesus? They're gone. Pride and self-deception go hand in hand. Now here's the deal with, with Eve. She was deceived. She was deceived by the devil, by the serpent. And there are people who will do their best to deceive you. I have been deceived. You know, I, I was deceived into thinking that an oil well was going to make me rich and I sold my Camaro. Well, actually, the bank sold my Camaro. I was deceived into thinking that this rainbow vacuum cleaner would, would, would help my life. And I spent all my money for this carpet cleaning device when I didn't even have carpet in my house. Me and a developer was going to build an airport and we surveyed the area and decided the best place to build one was in Climax Springs, Missouri. <laughs> this was many years ago, back before the church. And so, of course, if you're going to build an airport, one of the first things you need is you need equipment for the recreation room. And so we went out and bought a truckload of pinball machines and pool tables. <laughs> uh, I'm not necessarily saying I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer or the, the pointiest tack in the box, but... I've done some real dumb things. But you know, I was deceived. <laughs> but you know, the worst kind of deception there is is self-deception. And the Bible talks about that. There are some people that don't need any help getting deceived. They do such a good job on their own. They, they can mess up their own lives. And then usually what happens, they blame somebody else because of pride. The Bible talks about that. They mess up their own selves, and then they blame somebody else. They make stupid, stupid, stupid choices in life. Okay, this is not rhetorical. 
How many of you, and I'm counting myself, have made stupid choices in life? And for the rest of you, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> the Bible says that, that the humble will be exalted above the proud. Hmm. Matthew 23, 12, Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let me, uh, let me tell you that doing things and not demanding credit. Now, you can get credit for things. There's nothing wrong with awards. There's, I mean, if you're in sales, you know, if, if you have a job and you're in sales and you've got your office lined, the wall, just lined with awards you've received, that's not prideful. That's not, I mean, it's good business to show people that you know how to do business and, and you've got awards. If, if you're a salesperson, you don't want people to think that you've never sold anything before. You, you know what I mean? There's nothing prideful about putting 30 years in business on your business card or whatever. That's not prideful. It's not prideful to tell the truth. If you have the largest, whatever, uh, if you have the largest car dealership in the state and on your business card you have, we are the largest car dealership in the state. That, in a case like that, that's not pride. That's just stating a fact. If you truly are the largest car dealer in the state because that lets people know you sell a lot of cars and you probably have made a lot of people happy or you wouldn't have sold a lot of cars. You know, it's just kind of like... A, uh, Sherry Stevens, she has a, 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 a byline on her real estate business. She doesn't know I'm going to say this, okay? But on her card, it says there's, there's three things you need to know about real estate. Location, location, and Sherry Stevens. <laughs> well, now that's not prideful. I mean, that, that is just a, a catchy phrase that makes you think, my goodness, you know, she knows what she's talking about. She, look, to advertise is not necessarily prideful. We advertise the church. That doesn't mean we're prideful. But if we stick up on our sign, there's no church any better than ours. We preach the word better than anybody else. Our singing's better than anybody's. That's pride. But if we say, excellent praise and worship, that's not. You see, you see the difference. And God wants us to be truthful, and he wants us to promote his kingdom but he wants us to do it without pride, and that means pride as a group, but also individual pride. See, you can, you can have so much pride in your own house that you will never admit to your family that what you're doing has been wrong. And if you won't do that, that's called a lack of true communication. And that will destroy a family, it'll destroy a marriage, it'll destroy friendships if people will not communicate honestly. Now you can, listen, if you have a problem and you have a friend, you can tell your friend your problem. But my advice is, is don't do it too many times. You know, but, but you can tell your friend your problem and you can discuss things. You can tell your friend your accomplishments. You can tell your friend what you like and what you don't like. But you do it in conversation, not in pride. And there's a huge difference. If you discuss something to resolve something, that's one thing. But if you discuss it to prove something, that's something else. There is a difference. And see, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit in your relationships. Now, I have been told that what I'm getting ready to tell you is not a good thing for me to say. But see here, is, this is not pride. I feel it is. Because I think you need to know this. I believe in counseling, okay, as discussing things as a Christian. But... In my experience, in certain areas, with certain people, counseling doesn't seem to work. With certain people in certain areas. Because 
some people will use counseling as an excuse to prove their point. When they're not really wanting a resolution, they're just wanting somebody to agree with them. And although I think counseling is a very necessary part of life, because we do it all the time, and some people, we even have some professional counselors who do this for a living in our church, and I am totally 100% for them. I, I, I think we need these types of things. But I'm just saying that some, you, you need to be wise enough to know if somebody's coming to you for counsel or if they're coming to you to get you on their side. And there is a difference. One of them is humility, and one of them's pride. Hmm. Okay, I want to give you a couple scriptures here. Um, you know, some of the greatest leaders, uh, in fact, there's been surveys done on this, but some of the greatest leaders that we've had on, uh, on earth have been people who have tried to overcompensate for the rejection that they've had in their life. Uh, see, there are people who do reject you. You know, you've all heard the phrase about uh, some people are just paranoid, but you're not paranoid if somebody actually is out to get you. And sometimes people really are out to get you. And that's why you really need to be led by the Holy Spirit and not led by complaints or led by compliments. There will be, listen, depending on their personality, there will be people who try to make you do certain things in life by complaining at you. There are other people who will try to get you to do the exact same thing in life by complimenting you. Be led by the Spirit. Your security is not in your, in your compliments. See, I, I realized, now, I don't want to deter anyone who wants to come up to me and tell me how good this sermon was when, it, when I'm done. Okay, I don't, want, I don't want to discourage anybody from that. But I've, but I've learned over the years that I cannot base my um, I cannot base my thought on whether something was right or not based upon what other people say after you speak. Um, let me tell you something. I've heard people say, "Well, the pastor thinks this." Well, it doesn't matter what the pastor thinks. You say, "Whoa, what do you mean it doesn't matter what he thinks?" It only matters what God thinks. And if we're all led by the Spirit, we're all going to come to the same conclusion. Um, you know, God told Jeremiah, when you preach, don't look at their faces. Trust me. There are reasons for that. Um, you know, this person doesn't even live in this state anymore. So I can say this. Although if you're watching today, you know who you are. <laughs> and I love you. But I'm using this as an illustration. But there was this lady that would sit right over there. And uh, she would fall asleep while I was preaching every Sunday. And I don't mean she would just fall asleep like this. She would fall asleep like this. And I don't know if your little doggy does it or not. What's your doggy's name, Molly? I don't know if Molly does this or not. But this lady would kind of like let her tongue hang out a little bit. And her husband sat next to her, but he must have been stone deaf or something because she snored. And he, he never noticed. But the acoustics in this room are set up so that I noticed and I don't know if you've ever thought about what it's like preaching to somebody that snores. It, <laughs> it could be discouraging to some. But I would just talk to this group over here most of the time. You know, and I know the people over there are going, well, why is he ignoring us? Because this was the part of the church that was awake. You know? And... Uh, <laughs> Bless her heart, she loved God. 
And here's the deal. She worked all night. She worked all night and still came to church. And I'll just tell you, I'd rather for you to sleep through my sermon than not be here. You have a choice. <laughs> but see, I'm not supposed to judge her. And I certainly can't judge whether God gave me the right sermon, you know, by her. Because I would look, one time I looked up there, this little string of stuff was coming off her. And, you know, that, it's like, I'm wanting to watch to see if it actually drips, you know. Uh, you, hey, look, prideful people don't know who they are. Let me tell you something. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are a joint heir with Jesus. You are an adopted son. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. For you. And you, if you're a born-again believer, you're going to reign with him. And what's that mean? Listen to me, folks. Our future is really cool. Jesus is coming back to get us. We're going to have the judgment seat of Christ, which sounds bad, but that's where Christians are going to get the rewards for, for the things you've done. Nobody knew you did them. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to come back with Jesus and the enemy will be defeated. Satan and his goofy angels are going to be bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. There's going to be a heavenly Jerusalem and an earthly Jerusalem, and Israel will have back the borders it's supposed to have, and the entire world will be ruled under the leadership of King Jesus, and those who rule and reign with him, that's us. We will be in resurrected heavenly bodies we we will we will have eternal life already we will not be affected by physics we can travel back and forth from heavenly jerusalem to earth there will still be people in natural bodies on the earth but if you're a born again believer today that's not you and for a thousand years for a millennium we will be ruling and reigning with him now then Jesus is going to release the devil and his angels for a short time. They're going to gather some people up that don't like the way God's doing things. And then they will be crushed. And then all of the unrighteous dead, this isn't you, but all of the unrighteous dead throughout the centuries will be resurrected. And there will be another judgment. And Satan and his angels and all the unrighteous will be cast into the lake of fire. And then you know what happens? Then there's a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Now, now they're not different. They're not different. They're refurbished. There's two different words in the Greek. One means completely new and different. One means refurbished cleaned up, restored, and made better than new. And that's the word in the Greek where it says there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem coming down. And now, see, we talk about the millennial kingdom, but after, after that we have the eternal kingdom. And we will forever be the glorified, resurrected ones in the eternal kingdom. There will still be people on the earth. But that's not us. Unless you just want to be. and walk, But you're not going to be in an earthly body. You'll be in a resurrected body that will look earthly. But it will never die. And it has the glory of God running through its veins. I'm telling you, your future is really good. And if you just know how things are going to turn out, then there's really no reason to get all bent out of shape today because you got low air in the left rear tire of your car. Some of this stuff is just totally, you know, we're, we're going to look back on some of the stuff that we think is really big deals right now, and it's just going to be nothing. I remember sitting in my backyard as a 10-year-old, 
in Raytown, Missouri with all of my shoe boxes full of baseball cards. And I could not find my Roger Maris and Roberto Clemente card. I had a couple of thousand baseball cards, but something had happened to my Roger Maris and my Roberto Clemente card. And I was upset. And I, re I remember that I sat there crying and I prayed. See, I grew up in church. Prayed about everything. I said, Lord, help me, Jesus, find my Roberto Clemente and Roger Maris baseball. Well, they were in the box. I just hadn't found them. But the reality is, looking back on that, that was cute. But it really wasn't anything that changed my destiny. Let me tell you something. You have the living God inside of you if you're a born-again believer, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and no weapon formed against you will prosper, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and this is the victory that's already overcome the world, our faith. And listen, folks, the bad stuff that the devil tries to make you get all depressed about and the good stuff he tries to make you all prideful about, hey, don't fall for that trick. You just live your life in humility, knowing who you are and whose you are, and you'll be fine. You know, most conflicts, well, I really didn't get any further than where I was Thursday night. <sighs> It'll keep. How many of you will be here Thursday night? We'll continue on this on Thursday night. Because uh, I got a lot of notes. And some really good stuff. But not prideful. I'm not saying that prideful. <laughs> yeah, when I said it was really good stuff, what I meant was it really is. Because I got it from the Lord, you know. So, But uh, my goodness. Most conflicts in life, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be at school, whether it be at work. Anybody ever have a conflict at work? Most conflicts that stir you up don't have to. They don't have to. You say, but, but you don't work around the idiots that I work around. <laughs> Trust me, in my life, I've had my share of people. And I know some of you have had your share and some of you are having your share of people right now. But don't let somebody else's stupidness bring you out of your place in God and make you act stupid. Don't Allow yourself to be baited. See, you need to understand this. Everything's closed. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. In the Bible, there is a word called offense. And this word offense in the Greek is scandalon. If it were translated exactly, literally correct, the correct translation is bait stick. And you've all heard me tell the story, so I won't tell it long, but when natives would catch monkeys, the way they would do it is they would have a cage that had bars on it, and on the inside of the cage was something really shiny that monkeys were attracted to. And monkeys would come up, and they'd reach inside the cage, and they would grab a hold of this bait stick. But the bait stick was made in such a way that they couldn't get it out. They could reach in and get it, but they couldn't get it out. Now, the natives are running over, over the hill, and they've got their clubs, and they're going to go down there, and they're, they're preparing to have some monkey stew. Are you following me? The monkeys, and the monkeys can see the natives coming with their weapons, and all they got to do to get free is just let go of that bait stick. And they can, there's nothing holding them except their own hand holding that bait stick 
And so I've seen videos of this on the Discovery Channel. The monkeys, you know how monkeys will screech and scre They're screeching and screaming, and they know that they're just about to get killed because the natives are getting close with the clubs. But they will not let go of the bait stick. And the result is they get their head bashed in and die. And it's interesting that the Bible uses for the word offense, offended. It uses the word scandalon in the Greek, which means bait stick. And here's what happens. People, the devil through people will bait you. They will say, they'll say things to you, wanting you to respond and get offended, get hurt, get, get your feelings hurt. Get, and, and you just get to a point where you just, well, I'll show them. And, and then all of a sudden you've taken on an offense and you are offended. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to, they don't know it, but I'm going to give them the what for. And they don't know that I know this and I can come around the back door and I, I, I'm going to show them. I'll tell you what, they'll teach them to, teach them to mess with me. And all the while, your destruction is coming and you're holding on to that and you will not let go of that bait stick. See, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, in the last days, offenses will come. And woe to those who put them out there. But I'll tell you what, you have a choice. As a believer, you have a choice. You can either grab a hold of that bait stick, or when somebody does something, says something, or whatever, it doesn't mean you don't protect yourself. It doesn't mean that you align yourself in a relationship with somebody that you don't need to be with. That's not what I'm talking about. But you know what I'm talking about when I say offense, when it just eats at you and you just think about it all the time. And this is, I'm telling you, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about what they did. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to see that, that type of thing. That's holding on to that bait stick just, and just won't let go. Well, the enemy's coming over the hill with his club and he's about to pound you to death. You've got to let go. How hard is it to do this? Christians all over the world need to just do this. And you're free. You can run to safety. But you've got to let go of that offense. Let go of that hurt. Let go of hanging on to what that person said or what that person did. Because it'll eat you up. It'll destroy you. All right. Praise God.